Our president, uh, CH, uh, CHS president, uh, Paul, Wil uh, Paul Wilton, uh, said this morning that his factor eight level was at 14%. And I'm sure some of you wondered how he knew that. Um, and so Dr. Alfonso Aereo, um, I think the creator, or certainly the person behind uh, WAPS, is going to explain how that works. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. And just uh, for me not to forget, yes, I had the idea, but uh, behind uh, <coughs> the WAPS project, there's a team of 15 person. I hope I didn't miss anyone on the screen. Two universities, a, a software house, and uh, a lot, of, uh, a lot of advice from many, and a uh, lot of patience. So thank you, everyone. And also thank you, Canada, because I had this idea 20 years ago in Italy, and I couldn't implement it. I couldn't find a way of doing it. And actually, here it is, and it is here not only for us in Canada. So WAPS is currently used in a uh, bunch of countries, 435 centers. We have uh, profiled over 4,000 patients, 10,000 PK studies, which to me means it's useful. If not, I would imagine it would not be used uh, this way. And there are 27 centers in Canada um, using it for their patient. Um, any concentrate, no matter what you are treating on, um, I'm showing here for factor eight, a loctate is the one we have more experience on. And you see is close to 2,000 profiles. and. Uh, 1700s for Advait and so on. There's no other database of this size about how factor eight and nine, and for factor nine, you see 371 profiles on Alprolix. So a rich database, and we are learning a lot by looking at this one, but I'm not really willing to tell you about research. I want to tell you how this can impact patient life. So the problem is, uh, first of all, we have clarified a lot of concepts. The first concept is what matters of PK is how your concentration goes down in time. Volume of distribution, clearance, mean stress and time, AUC, all good stuff. But what matters for a patient is the curve over time. Problem is that if you have three measurement and you try to draw a curve, you can go like this, and I would say it's quite a good curve, but this might be Exactly the same, there is some error in the measurement and you cannot really tell which one is the right one if not taking 11 data points and uh, of course having only one way through. That's what UDA's old style PK says, you can't draw a curve with only three points. Now, I hope I'll convince you in 30 seconds that it's possible, then you have to help me convincing the PK expert that this is true. All PK world knows it. In hemophilia, there are still people saying, you can't believe pop PK, you can't believe uh, WAPS or my PK fit, you need to do a full study. Now, if you take into account all the sources of variability, fact that we are all different, then you can explain the difference. Problem is that all uh, lean person, um, person of a given blood group will be closer to green, and maybe those with higher body mass will be closer to red. If you know that, uh, you, can, uh, you can get as close as possible. So just to lead you there in steps, if I only know what is in the leaflet, in the package of the medication, that's the yellow line. That drug, on average, in a population goes that way. Now, I studying the population, and you have seen which number we have, I can tell you that for a subject like Jamal, that age, that weight, that blood group, is average curve. The group of patients like Jamal will go like the red line, okay? I know the shape, I know how it's different from the average. Then if I draw three sample, then I can just ask a complex statistical software to move that line to cross those three samples. This is why POPPK, taking into account all the other information, can do a very good job with only few samples. Few samples is important. This is how we do PK studies. You know, PK studies is you inject your factor, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, and we want to draw that curve. But we want to do that in an efficient way. For patients coming to my clinic from far away, they stay in clinic about three, four hours because it takes time, and that's the blue area. So what we do, we usually draw a sample before, 
As soon as they get to clinic, we draw a sample, we do an infusion, and then we draw another sample before they leave. One, one before, peak, infusion, three hour. Now, if they can come back, we draw a sample later on, day after, two days after, or whatever. If they cannot come back, what Poppy K again help you is that you can ask them, when you infuse last time, and you get an information about a previous infusion, and you can calculate how many hours after that one you are. Now, again, with Poppy K, you can use that point, the pre-dose now is also a late point from the previous infusion, and you can count it again as late. So in three hours, you do a study that involves pre, peak, and late, and you lump it all together. And you get uh, a curve. But now getting the curve is the beginning. I, I, I saw, I mean, George, George Rivard, with the three point and the curve, he can, uh, because it's uh, his experience, he's having done many times, I can do more or less the same. You can adapt that curve to what happened if I give 3,000 every three days, or 2,000 Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But it's not easy, particularly with long acting. And it's complicated. You need, you need Excel, you need to do some math. WAPS does it for you. You put in the dose, the infusion interval, and you get exactly what will happen over the week. And now in the version that we have released yesterday, you can also change the weight, not the age, unfortunately. We are working on changing the age of the, pa the, age of the patient. But for now, we can change the weight and the eight. For, for, for children, and you still get an approximate um, estimate. You get a curve over the week. This is very powerful in our experience when you show it to patient, and you understand why you bleed sometimes and not other times, when it's safe to do sport, when it's not. But beyond that, uh, you can say, okay, by giving 2,000 of whatever concentrate this was on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you get those peaks, you get those trough, and now the new version of WAPS tells you was the weekly usage, but also how much time you spend above one, above three, above uh, 15%. And you have learned this morning how important that is. And in this case, you spend 50, 60% above 15, and then above three all the time. Now, if this patient was willing to switch to 4,000 weekly, what would be? Well, 4,000 weekly, it would say the... The trough is now less than 1%, but the patient may insist with me saying, you know, I understand you don't want me to be below 1%, but I'm not bleeding. 4,000 once a week, I don't bleed. And actually, he is 80% of his time above 1%. So essentially, yes, it's suboptimal, goes below, but it's still 80% of the time above 1%. So for someone, maybe okay. Poppy K doesn't tell what the ideal trough is. That's the patient. That's the bleed rate that tells what the ideal trough is. These tools help you making decisions that are based on evidence. Now, end of the story, what matters is what happens if you do it. So there's now mounting evidence about the impact of tailoring treatment. Tailoring means I assess for each patient the profile and I build with a tool like this the ideal treatment regimen. That doesn't mean the treatment regimen to be above or below one. It's the treatment regimen that fits the need of that patient with their uh, level of activity and their, uh, uh, their lifestyle. Now, you can reduce cost, okay, but we are advocate for patients, so reducing cost is good, but what matters is reducing bleed. The second paper cited here, done in Japan using WAPS, show a reduction in uh, annual bleeding rate, annual joint bleeding rate. The, the third study we did in collaboration with a group in Germany, and we started screening 100 patients, only 37 decided to go on tailoring. It's maybe not for everyone, but those 37 who decided to do the PK study, three data points, and change their regimen, this is what happened. If they were on prophylaxis, now blue is before and yellow is after. This is the time in the, in the range, factor concentrate range. So above 15 goes up, 15 to three goes up, reduction in below 3%, even for those on prophylaxis. For those on situational prophylaxis, they were treating before physical activity. Time above 15 goes up, 3 to 15 goes up, complete 
reduction of a lot of time they were spending below one, just because they were treating before sport. And for those on demand, of course, no point. It's improvement in, in, in all areas. Now, bleeding rate went down for those on prophylaxis, was the same for those situational, and that's, that's okay. I mean, pop PK is a tool. If the patient knows exactly what he does and know when he will bleed and he treats before, he doesn't bleed. I never force my patient when they show me I'm not bleeding to change the way they treat. I might do better, but I might do worse. So, but still, they don't do worse, it's the same. Those on demand, clear a significant reduction in bleeding time. What about quality of life? Improvement, they felt that new treatment was easier to do. Um, improvement, they felt safer over time, and those on demand, less improvement, because they, if they were on demand, they don't like to infuse very likely, and so, you know, you get protection from bleeds, but you have to infuse more, and that may impact your quality of life. Now, you can even predict uh, this morning, Manuel Carqueo said uh, no one, almost no one goes back from EHL to standard. I may sign up on that, but how many of you switching from short to long had to adjust their dose? In my experience, almost everyone. You start with the dose and then you have to adjust it. There is way, now going back, okay. <laughs> Sorry. There is way, looking at data, and we have a lot of data on patient switching, to predict what will be the profile on the new concentrate looking at the old one. Now, this is all what you can do, but in practice, because this is where the tech part comes, in practice in Canada, WAPS is connected to CBDR. You can request a PK from within CBDR, and you get the result into CBDR. So ideally, if you want to use it in your own center, for those that are colleagues, you cannot leave CBDR, and from within there, you request a PK, you get the result. And if you are a patient, you can now get, uh, like Paul this morning, your own PK on your own device. Now, since we like to save your time, for Canada, I mean, my WAPS is available worldwide, and uh, if you are outside of Canada, or even if you are in BC and you don't have CBDR, you have to log in as, you have to create your user, and then you have to record your infusion. But if you are in the rest of Canada, you can say, I'd like to log in with my app, and then there is, hopefully there will be a list of app here one day. For now, CBDR is the only one. Canada is ahead of the pack. And you say, okay, I want to log in with CBDR. You magically go to your MyCBDR login page. You use your usual password that I understand from um, uh, Shannon. Sometimes it's too complicated, but if you choose it wisely, you can recall it. You use it, and you use one single password. And now you can see your PK, and you can go in the future and see uh, what your concentration will be this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, so it tells you where you are and where you will be. And if you try to record an infusion for non-Canadian CBDR user, you tap on this plus sign and you record your infusion. If you are logged in via CBDR, you tap there and you get a blue message that says, come on, you are a MyCBDR user. The infusion you have to record in MyCBDR. So it gets to MyCBDR and it also gets here in a nanosecond, and it, if, you, if you record an infusion on the MyCBDR app, you see this point moving up, and it tells you now you are up here. And you can get reminder on your phone when it's time to infuse, or I don't know, any suggestion to make this better, come over and we'll see if it's feasible. What's next? And, and, and this is my last slide. Again, we'd like to show that all of this together is, um, is better than every single piece. So uh, David will tell you in a second what probe is, but we have these three up now available and now linked in Canada, and we got funding from CIHR to show the impact of having a national database collecting information about infusion, information about bleeds, PK information, and quality of life. 
And I really hope uh, that uh, my colleagues in the room and the patient, and if you are here, but there are others you can be the messenger to, will help us with a simple data collection for the next year to find out what the impact is of connecting all this information. Then we'll have better treatment coming. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with you to see gene therapy and to see all what's in between. But in the meantime, we can get much, much more out of what we have just by learning and reflecting on what we are doing uh, on, a, on a daily basis, collecting the data in our clinical practice and, uh, and then analyzing the data. Thank you.